Welcome to Case Studies with the BizDoc. It is great to be back on Valuetainment. Today we're going to talk about Tesla. We've got cars, power walls, power roofs, a stock that's going to the moon, a CEO that says whatever is on his mind and then tweets it. Somebody's got to tweet now that the president is gone. All those in Lessons for Entrepreneurs this week. <laughs> Tesla. I'm glad to be doing this case study because three years ago I did the case study on Tesla and there were some things that we saw and found there that really have come true. Now, did I foresee a stock going up 10x in 2020 with COVID and everything that was going on? Well, no, I didn't see that. And yes, I think the stock is pretty high and pretty hot and a 1600 PE is awful crazy in today's stock market, but I'm not gonna weigh in on that. There's a lot of people talking about the bubble. When does it pop? When does it break? And when it breaks, does it, does it get all over Elon Musk? Well, I don't think so. The stock's gonna adjust, but let's set that aside and look at some lessons that entrepreneurs can learn from the man Musk himself. I'm going to dive in this week. We're going to talk about energy. We're going to talk about cars. But then we're going to talk about the context of how Elon Musk acts as an entrepreneur and how you can apply that to your business, whether you're an $800 billion electric vehicle company or, as I'm fond of saying, you're making T-shirts in Berlin. Before we get going, a lot of people ask about the shirts. These are actually authentic Formula One team shirts. People around the world have sent them to me as gifts, and my wife has also found them authentic collections on eBay where mechanics in Formula One have actually sold their shirts. This one is from last year when Lewis Hamilton won his seventh world championship with Mercedes. Salute, Lewis Hamilton. This is a tribute for you because as a seven-time champion, you were also recently knighted by the Queen. So if Lewis Hamilton is watching, we salute you, Sir Lewis Hamilton. Now let's get to the case study. Let's start with power. Regardless of how you feel about Tesla, you say, oh, they're just a car company. They are a major player in the electric market. There's a couple things that are absolutely undeniable to look at. And the fact is they've got products in the market. When you look at electric vehicles and they start getting compared to Volkswagen and GM and companies like that, what you got to remember is in 2020, Tesla made almost half a million cars. That's not an entrepreneur making two cars and saying he's going to conquer the world. And never mind that there's a lot of subsidies still on cars. That's very, very true, but it's true for everybody making an electric vehicle. If it wasn't for government subsidies, those vehicles would be more expensive for you and me. What's undeniable, though, is that while it's only 5 to 6% of Tesla, power is a very big deal. In that 2017 case study, I said that if you look at what is obvious, sometimes you miss what is big hiding in the background. And I happen to think that the Tesla power play is pretty big, and I want to dive into it a little bit. First of all, even though, as I said, energy is only 5% of revenue, it is a much larger percent of awareness when you step back and you look at Tesla as a whole. And there's one area of energy I want to take a look at. It's the house. And then the second area I'll take a look at is the charging of the cars themselves. Well, you've got solar roofs. Tesla now makes a solar roof. It looks like a regular roof. It doesn't look like familiar solar panels sitting on the roof. It looks like a regular roof. It's got a nice design to it. It's a little shinier, and there are some noticeable differences you can see, but if you had never seen that house, you might drive right by not noticing and realizing that that's a Tesla solar roof. Now, the roofs are very expensive still, but the Gigafactory in New York in 2020 really kicked into gear and announced that by the end of the year, they were going to be in the millions of house shingle type panels per year. That's significant. So whether you say, oh, it's too expensive, it's a gimmick, Elon doesn't know what he's doing. Well, he's in production, it's at a factory, and it's being installed. Yes, there's teething pains on the roof products in that it sometimes takes four weeks to do a whole house. And if you call regular roofers, you can get a roof done in three, four days. True. But when you take a look at the efficiency and what it brings to the environment, it's a very good thing. And people that can afford these roofs are putting them on. 
Then there's the Tesla Powerwall, which is basically a humongous battery that sits on the wall of your garage and kind of stores energy that might be coming in from the grid or from your solar roof, which balances the energy usage. Now, those are a little expensive for you and me on our homes, and you're not going to find them on apartment buildings anytime soon, but it shows that Tesla is making a huge difference in how we can store battery power. And by the way, all this research on solar and battery technology, you know where it ends up? It ends up in the car. This is an application of Tesla's learning. Now, there's something there that Elon does when he talks about products that I think is a, a pretty cool lesson here to talk about. Once a year, speaking of power, they do what's called Battery Day. And when they do Battery Day, Elon Musk will drop words about, oh, well, you know, I think we'll be um, 20 million units a year in vehicles someday. And people say, 20 million units, that's more than Ford and GM make together two years ago or something. But these are things that are talking about his vision. And I think from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it's pretty smart because he's setting his vision, his people, his employees, his team are seeing that and they understand where they're going and that the boss is saying, like John F. Kennedy said, by the end of the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. We don't have a rocket to do it yet. We don't have a capsule to do it. We don't have a device, a lunar module to land on the moon yet, but we're going to get together with everybody and we're going to design those things and we're going to get there. That is what Elon Musk does. And people miss the fact when they look at the short term and say, oh, Musk, he just made some big comment about something he's going to invent. Uh, you know, who knows if it's ever going to get there. These are vision setting statements. Now, I'll warn you about something. There was a vision setting statement that he made in 2017 about the Tesla Roadster. The Tesla Roadster was a great car. It was actually the first car that they made. And one of the first serial numbers belonged to Elon Musk. And I'll give you three seconds to tell me where that car is right now. If you said orbiting Mars, you're correct. He stuck it in one of his Falcon rockets, shot it up, and you may remember Starman was a astronaut dummy that was put into the car, bolted in place, and is up there orbiting Mars. So when you got billions and billions of dollars, you can take your first car and say, what do I do with my first car? Give it to my brother? No, nah, I'm going to shoot it into space. So <laughs> this is just Musk being Musk. When you separate that out, from what he's talked about, you'll understand how he plays product games that I'm talking about with his announcements, specifically with Roadster. And by the way, for those of you that don't know it, when he, these are the abbreviations for all of his cars, and it spells sexier. Model S, Model 3, Model X, Model Y, Model R, sexier. And the, the R is for Roadster. And he announced a car that would go zero to 60 in two point one seconds or something and would have a 600 mile range and have a top speed of 200 miles an hour. He said that in 2017. The Roadster will be out next year, 2021. And guess what? It's going to achieve those specs. And yet at the time, 2017, people say, he's not going to be able to do that. No electric car can do that at all. That's crazy to talk about it. Well, he set the vision and he's going to pull it off. And it may be a $200,000 car that is beautifully designed if you've seen the images of it, but that's the flagship of the brand. That is the flagship of the car brand. And he also set a vision that they pulled off. So the first lesson that I like is how he leads specifically. He sets specifics out there of where they're going, even if it's going to be a, a, a big walk up the hill to get there. And I admire that about him. He also teases products. You can do that, too. You can tease products in your tweets, and you can irritate your competitors. Now, some people will say, never announce a product until you're ready to announce it. I say you can tease elements of it, which gets your team going, because you're needling the competition, you're needling the market, and it's a rallying point for your team. That's my opinion. Other people believe, like Apple, we will never announce any products until we're on stage in San Francisco and Tim Cook walks out and announces them. Well, you know what? On battery day, Elon Musk does the same, but along the way, he will tease features, specifications, where he's headed, and kind of let you know where it's going. Now, true, he kept the world's ugliest truck under wraps and then announced the Cybertruck. Welcome to the Cybertruck unveil. Yeah!
So as you can see here, this is the Cybertruck. Now it's very cool, but it's not gonna get any awards, I think, for perfect utility or beauty. On the other hand, take a look at this, which is rumored to be the Model 2, which is a car that's gonna be under $25,000 and at 250 mile range. And this is a pretty sleek looking rendering. And there's some rumors that maybe it'll happen first in China to compete with some of the small EVs that are in China. But you can see when you look at those images that there is innovation that's there and he loves to tease the future even while he keeps certain designs under wraps to the last minute. Getting back to power, there's a second part of power which is the charging. Right now there are 1100 supercharger stations in America. What is a supercharger station? Well, those of you that know Teslas, you know exactly what they are. There are these big charging units that are white and red. You pull up to them and it's got very high voltage. You plug into your car and within less than an hour, within an hour, you can get about an 80% charge. Well, since you can go about 300 miles or more with these cars now, go in and have a bite to eat in about 45 minutes, you come out and your car is charged 80%. That's kind of the design, it's where they're set up. Well, the supercharger stations are joined now with what's called destination chargers. Destination chargers are those small gray boxes that you've seen that may be at a Holiday Inn or at a Marriott Courtyard or at a, you know, amusement park or a mall. These are destinations around town and 4,000 destination chargers and 1,100 superchargers, about 5,000 locations in the U.S. And if you count all the outlets, all the extension cords, if you will, there's about 20,000 of them, which they claim covers 99% of the US population. So what, Tom, what are we getting to here? I think there's something hidden. And recently, he leaked a tweet, Mr. Musk did, and talked about it's low key, but yes, we are working with another auto manufacturer to use these. Wait a minute. So he built 5,000 of these outlets here, another 1,000 superchargers in Europe and Asia. So basically, he has built a gas station featuring electricity. So if you're not paying attention, there are people that are gonna take their credit card, put it on an account, and they're gonna fill up their GM or their Toyota or their Nissan electric, or their Porsche Taycan, and they're gonna fill it up at Elon Musk's gas station. And if you don't think he's gonna make a buck on that, you're not paying attention. This is what I was talking about back in 2017. I said, listen, I think he's gonna have an energy footprint that is envious of people and they're gonna be coming to him. The issue is gonna be as the number of uh, electric vehicles increases out on the road, this may not be enough and it won't be. People will still be charging at their home. And so they have announced that 2021 is gonna be a crazy aggressive year for supercharger builds in the United States making this footprint denser and denser. And then on one day, it won't matter what you buy because you'll pull into the Tesla gas station to put those volts into your car. Okay, that's power. I wanna talk about a lesson that you can apply that's in the middle of this, the way he talks about products and the way he has talked about power and what he does on battery day. And that is to drive anticipation. And I apologize for some of this being repetitive with the other 64 million stories that have been written in the last year about Tesla, the stock, Elon Musk is crazy, he'll never get it there, subsidies are all part of it. You can have all your opinions on there, but remember, as I said earlier in this video, he's done it. He built 500,000 cars this year, half a million cars. And that's with a lockdown that happened in California and he had to sue Oakland, Alameda County, where Oakland and Hayward is, and if you're not from the US, it's basically Northern California near San Francisco, and that's where his factory is. And they did a lockdown because of COVID, war of words, and he said, I'm gonna sue you, or I'm gonna move my factory somewhere else. And because he's Elon Musk, when he makes those threats, people tend to believe him, because he's just crazy enough to do it. So anyway, even with that interruption, and the interruption, because the China factory was also locked down to that, he did half a million cars during the COVID years with two of his most important factories locked down for a meaningful amount of time and unable to do work. Half a million cars. So say what you will about the stock price, say what you will about his performance, but he did it. So now let's go and let's talk about the cars a little bit and talk about driving anticipation, which I think is something that entrepreneurs can learn from Elon Musk. When you take a look at the at the cars, they're 95% of the sales. Now let's take a look at, at the progression here, just to step back, 
set aside the stock hype a little bit, and let's just step back and just realize what he's done. Let's just go back, you know, six years ago. In 2014, he made 32,000 cars, $3 billion in revenue. Stock price is way down here, and that's this line here. Then 2015, 50,000 cars, $4 billion. 2016, 76,000 cars, $7 billion. 2017, crossed 100,000 cars. It was a big deal. People talked about it back then, $12 billion. 2018, more than doubled that, 245,000 cars, almost a quarter million cars, and 21 billion. And then in 2019, 367,000 cars, 24 billion. And then in 2020, what we've been talking about, half a million cars, and 28 billion is the estimate of where, where it was. And at the beginning of 2020, the stock price, $86, $80 billion company, was on par with General Motors and things. Nothing was too crazy. But during the year, this red line is the 10x run up that happened during the COVID year, where it's all the way to $860 a share, and it's an $800 billion company. And even if you're really optimistic about the way stocks can roll on, in the market, there is only one word for that, and that is damn. That is a big old jump in one year. And yeah, I do think it's a little overheated and it's got to come back at some place back to some sort of realization. There's also something that's hiding in the revenue. Let me tell you about it. Carbon credits. You've read about carbon credits or environmental credits that if you are a company that uh, has smokestacks or you create emissions, maybe you make paint, maybe you just uh, you know, produce whatever in a factory and you use a lot of electricity. You can buy carbon credits where you're purchasing credits against the emissions. Well, there are a bunch of subsidies in the cars here where the government is actually paying part of the car and you and I don't realize it, we just know the price we pay, but there's a subsidy artificially getting that down. There's also carbon credits that Tesla collects because it makes EVs. And guess what? Over the last two years, Tesla has been paid approximately a half a billion dollars by other car companies who don't make EVs and they are offsets, basically the environmental offset credit. So once those subsidies and once those offset credits turn a little bit, Tesla is going to have some adjustments on its revenue. Additionally, it's managed to be five quarters in a row profitable. And if you add up the credits, when you take the credits off, it's probably back to break even. So you could sit there and draw gloom and doom. <laughs> oh, that's going to kill the stock price at some point. But the point is, that's the playing field. And he doesn't have to apologize for that. But yes, some of this stuff is going to be changing. But it's going to be changing at a time where he's got the additional Gigafactory online in Berlin, as a matter of fact, uh, just this past month, he paid 100 million euros, which was a deposit to the German government for permitting fees and a fail-safe uh, financial plan, I believe it is, to build the Gigafactory in Germany. So he's got one in China, he's got one in New York, he's got one in Nevada, now he's going to have one in Berlin. Say what you will about the stock price. His arms are getting longer and he's putting factories around the world and he's actually getting paid by the other car companies for now on those credits. I want to step back real quick and look at the manufacturing numbers to understand where he could be going because I think this is a good point and I think everybody gets so freaked about the stock price that they miss things. 500,000 vehicles this year, that was two times what he did in 2018. So he's doubled in two years. That was five times what he did in 2017. And it was 10 times what he did in 2015. So in five years, he multiplied the number of cars by 10 times. Yeah, they got to get their arms around quality. Yeah, there's things they got to do. But the point is he kept driving forward. And as an entrepreneur, that's one of the lessons. You got to keep driving forward and you got to not be satisfied. Elon Musk does it by teasing products and driving anticipation. When he talks about zero to 60 of this speed, and he talks about at some point of 10 times, he's driving anticipation. This is the language of leadership, leading specifically. Have you ever seen a CEO or somebody's on CNBC or some news channel, you know, uh, BBC or something, and you see them and they spin everything and they manage to say nothing in 30 seconds when answering a question? Well, if you listen to Elon Musk a week ago, I heard him say, 
we need to make more cars at higher quality because we still have quality issues to get. And we got to get battery prices down so we can introduce a car under 25,000. He's very specific and he's not spinning with the, well, we're working on that and next year we got a strategic team that's going to look into things and we think we're going to have some um, improvements that we make and it's all part of our future plan. You hear statements like that and then you sit back and you say, wait a minute, there's nothing specific. It's just a spin job looking very, you know, CEO-like, and the man or woman is just trying to look very professional and put it up. Elon Musk is out there with his hair kind of going crazy and leading specifically, teasing his products, driving his anticipation. And he may be bold, but it turns out when you look at what's happened later, he's been sane. Musk boldly made those statements about the Roadster, and it looks like they're going to come through. Zero to 60 in under two seconds. Top speed of 200 miles an hour. That'll freak out your screaming mother-in-law if she's in the car with you. And have a top speed of 200 miles an hour, although you really don't need to do that. But it's also going to have a range of something like uh, 520 miles, which means you could go, in terms of the U.S., from San Diego to San Francisco. You will have to stop before the car does. Or you could go from Paris to London and have 300 kilometers left over to drive around and find a pub that's open, but they're all closed due to lockdown. Although if you're in London, I like to go to the King's Arms in Mayfair in a little corner of area called Shepherd's Market. That's like my favorite London pub. When I'm over there, I try to drop in. For those of you over in the UK, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, you see where I'm going. You don't have to necessarily agree with what people will say is hype. You don't have to get into the discussion of the bubble to sit back and say, as an entrepreneur, I don't have to be Elon Musk to learn from Elon Musk and do things for my business. I've lined them up here for you. I'm hoping that you can take that and apply it because it'll help you, whether you're running a t-shirt company in Berlin, a small startup in Dallas, Texas, or whatever it is you're doing. These lessons can be applied by you and that's what I love about startups and entrepreneurship. It doesn't matter how big or small you are, there's always something you can apply for you. Well, that's what I think, and I'm always interested to know what you think or what companies you wanna see me cover. Please leave a comment below, let me know what you think, and hit the button to subscribe to Valuetainment, the best channel on the internet for entrepreneurial content. And also, I'm happy to announce, Patrick Bet David has put a BizDoc shelf inside the Valuetainment swag store. So go check out some hats and shirts for yours truly, the BizDoc. If you like this video, you should check this out, also here on Valuetainment. And until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth, the BizDoc, hoping I left you better than I found you.